passage we chanted just now, the Magavipanga Sutta, the analysis of the path. takes one by one all the different factors of the path. And it's interesting to note the, the order in which the factors come. The first two have to do with discernment, seeing that the big issue in life is suffering and stress and particularly the kind of suffering that comes from our own actions, our own thoughts. That right there tells you a lot, that this is a path where you have to look at your actions, look at your thoughts. Although it may be wrong to make a distinction between thoughts and actions, as thoughts are a type of action and our actions come from our thoughts. It's in this area of thinking and speaking and doing with the body. This is where the real issues of life lie, the things that we're responsible for. And fortunately, because we're responsible for them, it means we can change them. If we were automatons or if we were driven by fate, we couldn't do anything about our actions. We'd just be sitting watching these processes happening without any control over them. But it's important to take a stand on this issue. That we do have choices, and we can change the way we act, which means that suffering can be brought to an end. There is a path that we follow. And it's interesting to note that the next factor that builds on that is a factor in which you try to gain control over your intentions, the things that you resolve on. There are three things the Buddha advises, one resolving on renunciation, resolving on non-ill will, in other words, goodwill for others, and resolving on harmlessness, in other words, developing thoughts of compassion. Because our actions come from these thoughts, so we have to get our thoughts in order before we can work on the rest of the path. Think about your intentions. Do you search for your happiness in sensual pleasures, or do you realize that there has to be another happiness that comes from letting go of those things? not being attached to them? Do you search for your happiness in trying to get revenge on other people, wishing them ill, being careless about how you treat other people? You've got to change those ways of thinking, because you realize that they're, as we said today, they're like boomerangs. They come back at you. So the first thing on understanding that this is a path to put an end to suffering. You have to work on your intentions. And even though this is a factor of discernment, as John Lee likes to point out, it's also a factor of, of virtue. In other words, you want your thoughts to be virtuous, harmless. The kind of thoughts that make create an environment where it's conducive to meditate. Because don't think you can go around thinking very sloppily and carelessly throughout the day, and then you can sit down and get the mind into good shape. You can do that through the force of your will, but it's not going to be the kind of concentration that really leads to discernment. It's a concentration that's built on denial, that's built on pretense. So it does matter what you think. It's not that when we meditate we just turn off our thinking, and it doesn't really matter what we've been thinking before we turn it off. We have to very carefully consider how we look for happiness in sensual things and remind ourselves, okay, that's not the true source of happiness. The happiness that comes from sensuality is 
carries all kinds of drawbacks, all kinds of delusion. So we have to look for that. Look for those drawbacks. See the kind of delusion that goes into sensual thinking. And remind ourselves that that's not what life that's not what life is all about. That's what we're not where happiness is going to be found. There's going to be something more. As for ill will, this is where the practice of metta or goodwill comes in. Ask yourself, is there anybody out there, or anybody in here, that you feel ill will for, that you would be happy to see suffer? And then ask yourself, what would you gain from that person's suffering? Because as we all know, when, when people are suffering, they tend to lash out when they feel threatened, when they feel insecure. That's when they do cruel and heartless things. And if they're not in the position to do cruel and heartless things now, they'll carry a grudge, they'll look for revenge down the line. So why would you want to wish ill of anyone? The same for harmfulness. You have got to have compassion. If there's anybody you'd like to harm, ask yourself, do you want to have that kind of karma? This is why right resolve builds on right view. You realize that. The harm you do to yourself, the harm you do to others, just keeps coming back and back and back again. So right view leads immediately to right resolve, the intentions around which you shape your life. But it doesn't stop just with the intentions. It's this virtue of your intentions, this virtue of your resolves, then actually has to show itself in the way you act. And it's interesting that right speech comes before right action. In other words, the words you say are the first thing in line. The principle of truthfulness, the principle of not being divisive in your speech, not being coarse in your speech, and not engaging in idle chatter. In other words, the kind of words that you say simply to have something coming out of your mouth. As a John Fuhr once said, if you can't control your mouth, there's no way you're going to control your mind. And the precepts that are easiest to break are the ones that have to do with speech. All you have to do is open your mouth, say a few words, and there you are. And again, if you're going around chattering all day in ways that are tell lies to yourself, tell lies to other people, how are you going to get the mind to settle down in a way that leads to true discernment? You've got to be careful about the things you say, the things you do, the way you look for your livelihood. Because these factors have an impact on the mind. They particularly have an impact on the ability of your concentration practice to give rise to further discernment. Because if the way you look for your living is harmful, you tend not to see it. You tend to deny the harm. And then when you're engaging in denial, how is your concentration going to be able to open up the, the dark corners of your mind, the areas that you tend to hide from yourself? So you've got to learn how to think in ways that are virtuous, act in ways that are virtuous. which makes it a lot easier to focus in on the mind, because you come to the concentration without any regret, and you've been developing good habits. If you're careful to act in harmless ways, it requires mindfulness, it requires alertness. You have to keep this principle of harmlessness in mind, and you have to be alert to notice what you're doing and the results of what you're doing, the implications of what you're doing and saying. The 
This is why when the Buddha wanted to teach the practice to his son, he started with this principle of looking at your actions. And even before looking at your actions, he established the principle of truthfulness. You don't lie. He says if you feel no shame at telling a deliberate lie, you really haven't given yourself to the practice. This leads to the factors that deal with concentration. There's right effort, generating desire, chandang janeti. You generate desire to abandon any unskillful qualities that have arisen, to prevent any unskillful qualities that haven't arisen from arising. In other words, you know you're going to a situation where you tend to think and behave in unskillful ways, you prepare yourself. Train yourself to think in new ways so that you don't react in the old unskillful ways in those situations. You generate desire to give rise to skillful qualities that are not there yet and to develop the ones that you do have to, the, to their culmination. There's desire, persistence, upholding your intent. That's what the phrase says. This is how the Buddha teaches concentration practice. You start out by looking at the qualities in your mind, the qualities that influence your thinking, and talk yourself into wanting to think in skillful ways. Skillful here means ways that are harmless. ways that are beneficial. So again, the, the meditation doesn't start by just stopping your thought processes, it's directing them in skillful ways. And being very honest with yourself, where is this thought going? Is it imbued with right resolve or wrong resolve? If it's wrong, what can you do to put an end to it? If it's right, what can you do to encourage it? And how can you make it even more skillful? This leads to the factors of right mindfulness and right concentration. Mindful, ardent, and alert. The ardency here is the carryover of right effort into right mindfulness. Make up your mind you're going to keep one thing in mind, or to keep one thing as your frame of reference. It can be the body, feelings, states of the mind, mental qualities. You give the mind a constant frame. When it has a constant frame, it can see things a lot more clearly. In other words, say you're going to focus on the breath in and of itself. The Buddha encourages you to become sensitive to the length of the breath, and to train yourself to be able to be aware of the entire body as you breathe in and breathe out. This is important because when you get into the levels of right concentration, you have to take whatever sense of ease or pleasure there is and allow that to suffuse the whole body. So you want to get sensitive to how the breathing process is experienced in the whole body, and wherever you See that it's coarse or forced. Try to make it calm. Make it more soothing, refreshing. Because it's when you're focused steadily on one frame of reference like this, that's when you see the subtle movements of the mind that you might have missed. if you weren't focused. The difference between riding around in a train and getting off the train. If you're riding in the train, you look out and everything's moving. Even the river is moving, the trees are moving, the mountains are moving, because you're moving. But if you get off the train, stand still on the ground, then you see, oh, the, 
the water in the river is moving. So the trees may be moving a little bit in the wind, but the trees are solidly fastened in the ground, and the mountains are not moving. And then you see what actually is moving in relationship to the mountains, because you're still and you have a frame of reference that's still, solid. This practice of mindfulness tends toward right concentration, that full body awareness. It can be filled with a sense of ease, a sense of rapture. In the beginning you're thinking about the breath and evaluating it, but when it gets really comfortable you can just allow your awareness in the breath to fuse, to become one. From that oneness there's a sense of ease. If the rapture becomes disturbing, after all, you may get a, have a feeling that's just too much. You can tune in to an, a level of energy that's a lot more refined, a lot more easeful. You allow that to permeate the body. And as things become more and more to an equilibrium, you finally get to the point where you don't have to breathe in or breathe out. Your awareness is very still wide open, filling the whole body. It's by training the mind in this direction it becomes a lot more sensitive. You can look again at that issue of where there's stress, what's causing it. So the path loops around in this way. And John Munn, according to John Leem, made the point that these three factors of the training discernment, virtue, and concentration really permeate one another. I mean, the discernment that looks at the issue of stress and tries to develop skillful resolves, there's an element of virtue in that discernment. There's an element of concentration that stays focused on these issues as the important issues. The virtue that builds on right view and right resolve. That involves virtue, and it requires the qualities that lead to concentration, mindfulness and alertness. The same principle applies to the concentration. It has to partake of discernment and virtue in order to get anywhere. I mean, it is possible to get the mind into good, strong concentration. Well, we wouldn't call it good, strong, but strong concentration without much discernment, without much virtue. But that kind of concentration doesn't go far leads to all kinds of misunderstandings, the idea that we have no free will, that whatever comes up in a concentrated mind is to be trusted, that the precepts can be cast aside by somebody whose mind is really concentrated like this. There can be a lot of delusion in a concentrated mind if it's not imbued with the virtue and the discernment. So all of these things come together. You look at the different factors of the path and they partake of one another. Right concentration includes right mindfulness. Right mindfulness includes right effort. They all contain one another in the same way that virtue, concentration, and discernment is the larger category. So they penetrate one another as well. It's when you put them together like this, that's when the path becomes right. So even though there are eight folds to the path, it's all one piece of paper. And even though we, sit, th <clears throat> we think of the practice as something you do when you're sitting here with your eyes closed. That's not the case. It's everything you do throughout the day. That's part of the practice. It's part of the training. Now the question is, are you training yourself in these three trainings? Or do you have some other surreptitious trainings going along on the side? Do you have other agendas going along on the side? If you do, they're going to get in the way of the training.
They eat into the training, weaken it, sap its strength. So it's a training you're engaged in all day long, whether you think about it or not. You're training the mind in different directions. If you're training it in unskillful directions, that's called training the mind. Whichever the way the mind goes in its thinking, it tends to bend itself in that direction, the same way you would train a vine up a wall. Whether you're thinking about it in that way or not, it is a training. So as you make your choices throughout the day, remind yourself you're training the mind. Are you training it to stay on the path? Are you training it to wind off into other directions? Because it's all one mind. The mind that gives the directions to speak, the mind that gives the directions to act and to think. The same mind that's sitting here meditating right now. To try to train it in the directions that the meditation gives results. The instructions that a preceptor gives to a new monk at the end of the ceremony. is to train in heightened virtue, train in the heightened mind, train in heightened discernment. That's the focus of what we're doing here. Now, the very last line in those instructions is, in those trainings, try to perfect them with a strong sense of heedfulness. Realizing that any choice that pulls you away from the trainings, or that you make outside of the trainings, it's going to have its impact. So don't allow yourself to be careless.